everyone. Welcome back to the Gary Champion Show. We are clapping. We're excited. Our in-studio guest um, has been here before. I, I don't know. I'm just trying to get him to hang out every Monday. I don't know. Or maybe every Friday. I don't know how that works. Uh, we're mm. bribing him with breakfast burritos. Yes. Big time here. Big time. <laughs> My love language. <laughs> Our analyst, uh, Mike Golick Jr. <laughs> What's up? I'm very, I'm very well fed this time. And I brought this as his proof because last time we talked about the small cup of coffee, and I, I know you guys yeah. talked about getting more in the budget. Yeah. This is the very large cup of coffee yeah. you get around here at the Kerry Championship. Listen, so the come up, is real. the comp is real. You had a, a healthy uh, breakfast burrito. Tell, Ooh. tell the folks about that breakfast. Yeah, no, it wait right for me in the green room. Their first class experience all the way. I just said I felt a little guilty because. The time it took for me to enter the green room and for that burrito <laughs> to no longer exist in that form was really scary. And I didn't want your crew to think that I hadn't, like, eaten in days or anything. Uh -huh. This is just how I'm built. Uh -huh. And by the way, no judgment. I walked out today. Be, the, you guys are getting behind the scenes with this. I was like, he's not going to be able to finish that whole burrito. Like, he's not going to have oh. enough time for it. And you're like, watch me. <laughs> I, 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 Watch I, me. I do this. Hold I, my beer. I spent a lot of my life <laughs> north of 300 pounds, which uh -huh. meant I got very good uh -huh. at eating. Uh huh. Okay, listen. Every time you come, breakfast burrito. Mm, um, there you go. They listen, or what? I mean, whatever. Whatever you want, it's on us. Um, I will say this: tell everybody about your podcast because your sense of humor, your knowledge, all of it—it's just at a perfect pitch. Tell everyone where they can find it and how they can listen to you and your partner. Yes, absolutely. Uh, the Gojo Podcast, uh, wherever you get them, Apple Podcast. Um, iHeart, Spotify, all those fun places here. Uh, you can check, check it out there. Like you said, um, my partner on that show, my producer, was one of my former teammates at Notre Dame. His name's Brandon Newman. Crazy. He was a defensive tackle with us. We literally rammed into each other head first in practice all day and then would go to all of our classes together. And now we get to talk about sports together, and it's a great time. <laughs> it's so. a perfect combination. Great chemistry. You guys do a good job. You had Katie Nolan on. She's been on a bunch. Yep. But that's when I was, when we were researching Katie Nolan coming on the show, I just love the way you guys, it's very, it's very beautiful, it's effortless, and so hopefully we can do that here. I, I, I have a feeling you guys are going to be able to do something very much like that here. And that's kind of my thing is I just go towards, like, I gravitate towards people like you and, like, Katie, uh -huh. who are just going to make me sound better <laughs> by being, like, everyone's like, oh, man, you do such a great job. And you have, like, Katie on this. I was like, that's because she's really good. Uh, no. And I come over here and sound good because no, you're really good. No. And so that's kind of the secret the, to all of this. Look, look, lightweight, because I'm telling you, he's lightweight. I don't have to do any lifting with this. I'm like, <laughs> just, just turn him on and go. Well, we were talking Deion Sanders. Yeah. So, and it's mixed emotion, so I want to hear about it, because you played college ball. Yep. Could you imagine Deion Sanders, you know, in theory, coming to Notre Dame and saying, transfer portal is open, and, and, and saying it unapologetically, and my son is the new quarterback, he's going to have to earn it, but he is, uh, and it now all makes sense, because... I'm watching, and I told you Josh McCown was on a show, and yeah. his son was the quarterback there, and he just posted, he's leaving. And I was like, oh, well, good for him. Maybe he's going somewhere more exciting. Be honest. Give it to me. Yeah, so, and I went through a coaching change when I was at Notre Dame. I came in, Charlie Weiss was my head coach, and then Brian Kelly, who's now at LSU, came in uh, at the end of my sophomore year. Yeah. And so I went through a transition, so I know what these guys are going through, and you know, we've heard a lot about the record and where the program was. Anytime a coach is fired, college, pro, anywhere else, when something happens like that, it's because things aren't going well and because everyone hasn't held up their end of the bargain. You know, I always felt bad. Charlie Weiss is the one that got fired, but we didn't go out there and play well enough. We didn't go out there and execute well enough. And so everyone's kind of on notice. We talk about that in the NFL all the time. When they fire a coordinator or they fire someone there because the winds have really dried up, it's a signal to everyone around. We got to step it up because if they're firing those people, we're next. And right. now I think all that is to say the tone that Dion came in and set was a reminder that transition is difficult for all these players. And I grew up and heard from a coach uh, at my high school very early on this idea of listen to what I say and not how I say it. Because with Dion, the packaging is going to be big. It is going to be bold. It is there to sell whatever he's a part of. Prime That's time. why we've been talking about Colorado football for the last 24 to 40. When does that ever happen? Exactly. This is what he brings. And this is part of that all access. And so all of that was going to be about cutting a promo, right? 
Deion Sanders, that entire speech and the way he structured it was a signal that, all right, you are going to pay attention to us and also portals open for business. In modern college football, that's just smart practice. Now, saying that my son's going to be the quarterback, that may prove to be strategically not as great because you want to open the doors to anyone that's going to come in and help this because we saw that with Lincoln Riley this year in Southern California. The easiest way to jumpstart a program in modern college football is to pop open the portal left and right right now. Guys you, are jumping in. Do you think, and it's good that you bring up Lincoln Riley in USC and what he's done at that program has been amazing. Yeah. They didn't do well against Utah. We'll get into that later. Mm. Um, mm -hmm. But do you think he did not have his quarterback all ready to go? Do you think he really legitimately opened up the portal and had no idea who was going to start? Oh, no, I think he had a very real idea, but there's also a difference of saying it when you're setting the tone and starting to build a program. Got it. Got it. Is because the, Got it. The, and the thing that I, I looked at his message about the portal, the larger context of what he basically said is, we're going to you know, reset the standard around here. Mm -hmm. It had slipped in recent years. Mm -hmm. We're going to reset the standard. We're going to work a certain way. We're going to conduct ourselves a certain way. Mm -hmm. And if you want to go about it like that, and if you think that you've got that in you, that'll be great. We're here to compete. And if not, there's the door. Correct. And so all of that is, to me, inviting competition. It's the foundation of every okay. great program that we hear about is we're going to go out there, compete, compete, compete. And when you say that and then you say, but my son's going to be the quarterback, it's like, oh, well, then. So oh, I get what you're saying. Yeah. I don't mind you being honest about saying, you, here's my luggage, this is the Louis, I'm bringing stuff. You don't have to be That was here. just a good line. That was know. a great line. Like, That's a great line. He was going to get that in, come no hell matter, or high water. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. I brought my, I got my luggage. It's Louis. Right. Like, if you have the chance to say that yeah. and make it sound as effortless and cool, you take that chance. You dive Even, even it. if it's going to be a little bit abrasive to you, people. You go ahead and do it. You dive right in there. <laughs> you dive right in there. But you also make a good point that if you are really open to true competition, you don't say that your son is going to be the quarterback because that could turn away any potential prospects. But perhaps that is what he wanted. He probably sees, he thinks, you know, like most fathers do, yep. right? He sees something in his son that he thinks is special. I do believe, though, if his son doesn't get it done, he will be done, meaning, like, he'll sit him. He won't let him. Oh, no, that's... I, I, don't, I don't doubt that he'll be like, okay, you're not getting the job done, son. That seems abundantly clear. And that's another thing, you know, and I'm sure, you know, for the players of Jackson State that have seen him interact with his uh, kids there, that... That's a message that gets sent. You know, there's plenty of places. You look around college football, there have been plenty of sons that have played for their dads. Correct. That happens all over the place. All the time. A lot of the time. And so that's not unique in all of this. But I, I don't know. All of this is just really interesting to me because I think a lot of it is going to be however you feel about this press conference is going to be kind of however you feel about Dion. For sure. And because there's parts of it, like I said, parts of it that rubbed me the wrong way a little bit where he said, you know, we're not going to put up with the mess that – you know, these fans and so-and-so and your parents have put up for a while. I'm like, all right, could have probably done without that one. But yeah, overall, the sure. message of it is not anything that's not being said by most new coaches behind closed doors. Yeah, Dion just let us in. Well, and, and here's the thing. Here was my method. I'm thinking there's a method to the madness. He doesn't want you to be surprised no. by who he is because he's not going to want to hear it. He knows he came from a school where no one's really paying attention. For him to come to this D1 program, he's like, if I'm going to be here, i got to do it the way that I've been able to do it, the way that I've done my entire career, the way that I've lived my entire life. And there is something, yes, off-putting about that, but also endearing at the same time. It's very on brand. It is. And you know what? I would The way I would always phrase it, too, is... I would rather hear an uncomfortable truth than a sweet-sounding lie Let as a player. Let me tell you something about an uncomfortable truth. Like, that's... Especially as a I player. I love an uncomfortable truth. Yeah. You would rather be dealt with <laughs> up front. You want to know what you're walking to as a situation because now these players at least do have the portal. Like, mm -hmm. him saying that, that's a positive. Let me jump on it. Because coaches <laughs> used to be able to say, oh, no, we can sell you the dream because they need depth to fill out a roster. They need people that are going to stick around and be backups and run show team. And that's not what everybody wants to do. And before, right. when a coach came in, you didn't have the ability to jump into a portal and then go play right again right now. Mm -hmm. You had to sit or you were stuck where you were at. And you didn't have a choice based off who you had committed to to come there and yeah. play for. Yeah, let me tell you, the, the transfer portal is a blessing for many. For yes. many, for coaches and for players alike who feel like they're denied the opportunity. Um, uh, I'm not going to go way too back into the weeds of this, but um, that's an interesting take on Dion. And I and I got to be honest with you, I have to. I was asking Andrew, uh, Andrew. I don't want to say your last name because I don't want to give your government information out. He's our, yeah. he's our line producer. He said that's okay. I could. 
<laughs> is it Andrew Simon's first name? Yeah. <laughs> I'm not none, Andrew. None of this is real. None, none of, of you will real. ever know my location. You don't need you to. You don't need to know. But he says, I would feel a way as a parent. And so I appreciate you both giving me that aspect as a parent. Because there's a par probably a parent who is very put out. And, and, and we're not surprised by that. I didn't have a, I, my cold, dark heart. Didn't even think of it as a parent. But speaking of what's going on with uh, coaches and saying whatever they feel... Mm. Let's go to Nick Saban because yeah. I don't think I don't think any of us are surprised by by his behavior. No, I mean he's a full-on politician. So Nick Saban, Alabama, you guys know the backstory, right? Uh, what I would say to the committee or anyone else is, if we played any of these teams that are on the edge or getting in, would we be the underdogs or would we be the favorite? You know what, Nick? Your thoughts? Well, <laughs> listen. Him and Dion did a certain commercial and a bunch together. of them together, right? Which ones? It seems it seems like the one the ones with the fine duck. I don't want to give them free advertising <laughs> on your guys' show. I don't know if they're ad partners on here or not. Okay. But uh, I will. But um, you know they did a lot of that together. And so what we saw from Dion, right? He's going to be what the space needs him to be. He is going to morph to fit that situation to say, here's what we need in this present moment right now, and I'm going to go out here and try and give it to you to put us in the best position going yep. forward. Yeah. That's Nick Saban. Yeah. That's what he yep. is doing here. Nick Saban is going to be whatever the situation calls for. Think about that guy. You think he wants to be out here asking people? Nick Saban has not had to ask for stuff in quite some time. Listen, but like. you know, he's the only, it's interesting about football versus basketball. Yeah. You know, what I've noticed about some of these coaches, especially in basketball, as NIL is more prevalent, mm -hmm. you're watching some of these these diehards retire. Coach K, yeah. Roy Williams, um, uh, the guy from Villanova, Jay Wright. Like, all of these coaches are leaving because the game is changing. And Nick is still thinking he can operate how he used to operate. And as Danny Connell just said, a former colleague of ours, uh, he's out there like a used car salesman. You know, car salesman. Car salesman. Can you get that out, Carrie? And I think, I think that he is realizing that his influence is not what it used to be. I think to an extent, I give Nick Saban a ton of credit. In the last two decades, there has not been a coach that has demonstrated the ability to change over and over again. You think he's done that? Quite he like could. Nick. Oh, I think you okay. look at the ways that they've been winning. The teams that beat my Notre Dame team in the title look completely different from the teams in okay. 2019 and okay. 2020 okay. where you've got first-rounders at quarterback. He has gone and maximized the portal to use that to plug holes on that roster. Mm. He changed his complete philosophy on offense when guys like Lane Kiffin came over to become the coordinator because he was responding to what was happening. He looked around, and I always tell people this. Anytime you hear Nick Saban complain about something publicly, mm -hmm. he's telling you, you can change this or I'm going to use it to beat you yeah. because I'm better at this than you. And yeah. almost every time he goes out there and he leverages that. Mm -hmm. And so I think in this spot it was, hey, I got to do what it takes for the time being, knowing full well two losses on the docket for a Nick Saban coached Alabama team. That's far below the standard. And so he's going to go out in here and say this because, hey, we go out and we're aligned publicly, but privately mm -hmm. it's I'm sure they know changes are coming on that staff with the way they do things for what comes next for Alabama. So football. instead of being a used car salesman, he is actually campaigning for what he wants ultimately to happen with his team or perhaps also at the same time telling the committee pay attention to us yes absolutely he's gonna say you know what it's my job to coach my team mm -hmm. if i have a chance to influence you guys to put us near the ultimate prize he's a competitor mm -hmm. he wants to see his team in those spaces because that's good for him and so why wouldn't he go what's the worst that can happen that's a shooter shoot moment from nick saban what how would you describe him Personally, not like just if what is his personality? Hey, I'm I'm interested in college football, uh, Mike Golick. Tell me about the most winningest coach in college football. His name is Nick Saban in Alabama. What what's his personality like? Competitive. That's that's the only thing I could use to describe Nick Saban. Because I don't know him beyond that. Okay. Like I don't think the rest of us real all we know is that he has been to college football what Bill Belichick has been to the NFL mm. for my adult lifetime, mm -hmm. which is someone so obsessed with any possible way to win that he would never once get stuck on stubborn adherence to one way of doing things. Hmm. You know? You don't believe that Bill Belichick or Nick Saban is stubborn? I believe they're stubborn, but I believe they're stubborn in different ways. And I think you watch both programs. Now, with Bill, it's a little different because you had Tom there for a long time. Tom helps out. Tom, That guy, Tom Brady, he's, pretty, he's a pretty good 
quarterback. But even inside the Patriot <laughs> dynasty, yeah. we saw that team win a bunch of different You're ways right. and win with You're a right. bunch of different stars at the helm. He always plugged and play. He didn't care. You What's the guy, the running back who showed up for the Super Bowl, won the MVP, and then we never heard from him again? Do you remember when they won the Super Bowl and, the, and, and Tom gave him the car? What is the kid's oh, name? Oh, God. Gray? Am I making... Oh, Andrew, well, can you help me out? Who is the Jonas Gray? Well, so <laughs> Jonas was, uh, yeah, Jonas had the great uh, performance against the Colts. It was uh, middle of the season. He ended up on a Sports Illustrated cover. Right. Something. And then the rest of the season, he ended up in Bill's doghouse. Why? Why? Because he didn't come to practice? What yeah, happened? Yeah, I think he was late for a meeting or something. And, I, like, Jonas is one of my teammates in college. Like, okay. I know Jonas. Okay. He's an incredibly talented guy. We weren't surprised to see him I blow up he, the way he but did. But I thought he played in the Super Bowl and did well, and then we never heard from him again. That's not true. He played in the middle of the season and did really well, and then he was on that Super Bowl team. Oh, he ended okay. up on that roster, but okay. – um, a little more in the doghouse for the rest of the season. Okay, so but you're right about it. The point being is that Bill Belichick will sit you. He'll he'll make you understand. I don't need you. Yep, exactly. And we've seconds. seen that with free agents that sure. he allows to leave, sure. guys that come there as productive players but then become too expensive. A lot of that was because he had Tom. For Nick Saban, it's because once they got into that winning flow, once he got over the hump initially, you had the trophies. You can push all the rings on the table and say, I am going, he has the two most important things in college football recruiting. Mm -hmm. I can get you a championship mm -hmm. and I can get you to the NFL. That's all that matters. You ever been there? Have you been to Alabama? Have you ever been uh, to the university? I have not been down to Tuscaloosa. Uh, let me tell you, we did a show down there, and I walked into this room, and it was like everything. He, he sells it all. Every yeah. single room you walk in, they're like, these are the people who've been to the NFL. If I am a kid getting ready to play for, I'm like, this is me. I'm, I'm going straight to the league once I leave here. But then you, but, but with that being said, I do believe you're, you, you like Nick a little more than I do, and I appreciate that because I see, I see him as a just, as how I see him. Yeah. And I don't know if I appreciate that style, but it does get the job done. I have a respect for Nick Saban. That, as we all For should. anyone that accomplishes that over time. But also, like, knowing coaches, as we both do, we've seen enough of them all operate. Like, yep. They are stubborn to a point where they'll stick with their ways, even if it ends up costing them and their that's job. that's who he is. That's never been who he is. All right, so uh, we're going to take a quick break. But really quickly, what about USC choking? <coughs> Ooh. <laughs> Caleb Williams, uh, take good care of that hamstring because that was the difference in the game. Oh. Like, oh. That, that, Utah, that Utah team. That was. Those are some mean young men. They're, they're mean young men? They, are mean. <laughs> they, walk into, they walked into that stadium with bad intentions, and it showed. And my, oh, my, was that fun to watch. I, again, I wish Caleb Williams well. He is, I mean, we're going to get ready. Uh, I'm a Heisman voter, so I get ready to cast my vote today. Hold on, time Yeah, out. I know, yeah. I hold like on, to, time out. I like to drop that hold in. Hold on, on. Do, okay, hold uh -huh. on, okay, drop it, drop mm -hmm. it, drop it, Heisman voter, yeah. okay. Something, something light for a Monday morning. Oh, uh, something forever. light to go with your burrito and full cup of uh, coffee. You know, it's just this is kind of the kind of stuff that fuels the vote. Uh, <laughs> and so all that is to say, I can't comment on who I'm going to vote for or who I think is going uh -huh. to win. But uh -huh. Caleb's got a great shot, and it was it was a bummer because I think for me the one thing about that game, and I'm happy for Utah. Kyle Whittingham's got an incredible program there. Yeah. I kind of wanted to see the guy that's probably going to win the Heisman I get in it. the college football playoff going yeah. up against that George defense. That would be cool. Well, look, we playing the music. That means we go on a commercial mm. break. So we're going to go to commercial break. That means the roller right now. We go on a commercial <laughs> break. I love what he said. We're at Oscars. The Oscars here. Some award show. We'll be back in just a few moments. Woo. Okay. You guys, it's crazy. It's, it's, it's crazy. It's so wild in here. Um, Anna Marie, can I give Mike Julik, to, uh, Golik Julik, Golik Jr. to come here every Monday with burritos? You think so? The burritos work. This big coffee, I'm like sweaty now. Can we pay you now. in burritos? Yeah. That is actually my preferred currency. Yeah. <laughs> Everyone else is investing in Bitcoin and all that stuff and losing their money. You're I just like, take all mine in burritos. I'll take all mine in burritos. Okay, so Sunday surprise. Um, last night I'm I'm sitting at home and we are we are. You don't know that we have conversations about you and you're not even here. Step on in, Anna Marie. What you got? Okay. <laughs> just a, can you guys see my Golic Jr. sign now? Can you take us to a? Can we? Yeah. See, here we go. That's who he is. Sweet. You guys don't know what's happening here. We're having a lot of fun. Yeah, uh -huh. it's a great time. <laughs> Come, <laughs> Come on, on in. <laughs> so we literally were like texting about you, and she's like, "Should we call Mike?" I was like, "God, I don't want to harass him, but I do." Yeah, I mean, it's not harassment. Is it? It's just being a part of. I like being a part of conversation with friends. Let's see, 
you and his friends chatting. Yeah. So then Sunday Surprise is the idea of who the heck surprised us on Sunday. And I, Brock Purdy, who? Mm. So I go to Twitter, he's trending. I'm like, who's Brock Purdy? Am I, did I miss that Jimmy is? And then I'm like, oh, Jimmy's yeah. injured. So talk to me about the quarterback who came out of nowhere and helped the 49ers look relevant, and he's Mr. Irrelevant. Yes, I was going to say, Mr. Irrelevant getting some shine. Normally, it's just the last pick in the draft, which Brock Purdy was coming out of Iowa State. You get the parade, you get all the fun stuff that they've started doing along with it. Very rarely do you go out there and get to play meaningful NFL football the way that he <laughs> did. But no, it was... Wait, wait, but explain yeah. Mr. Irrelevant. 262nd overall, the very final pick the, in the... Like, no more after him. The very last pick in the draft. And I forget when it was, but they started to kind of turn that into a big deal and they give you they literally throw you a parade uh -huh. for being the last pick in the draft uh -huh. there are some guys that would rather not get picked uh -huh. at that point because uh -huh. when you're an undrafted free agent you get to kind of pick and choose uh -huh. you're the bell of the ball at that level but yeah. Brock Purdy he was Mr. Irrelevant, so he got to go. And, I mean, think about it at that point for him, Kerry. He's walking into that situation where he is a distant third on the depth chart. Distant. Trey Lance is supposed to be the starter here. Jimmy Garoppolo was too handsome to let leave, yeah. and so you're just sitting here at third. I'd like to I'd like to say that that's very fair. That is? Oh. Jimmy's handsome. He's incredibly handsome. Like, honestly. Well, ever, ever since Cam Newton retired, he is now number one and handsome in the league. A 1,000%. One th I'm, okay, can we do a segment called the most handsome quarterback in the league? Colleen, he, oh. you didn't tell me he could do this. Oh, oh. My, my, listen, when, I don't know if you remember, a certain list came out that had a little bit of bias baked into it. We on the Gojo podcast decided to re-rank the uh, top five <laughs> handsome remember. quarterbacks in the NFL. Okay, who was, oh, give it to me, give it to me. Well, I mean, you had, so Jimmy was a clear number one there. Tom Brady worked his way into the back end of the top five. That's sort of like a president, Amer like a, you know, he's got tenure. Yeah, president emeritus. I was. I limped up to the word, and then Latin scares me, so I backed away from it. <laughs> Tom Brady's in there for being pretty handsome. The one I'll always go to the mat for, I'm actually very curious your thought on this, because I always say to me, he's like, uh, you know, they talk in the Hall of Fame. Like, some guys aren't the Hall of Fame. They're the Hall of Very Good. Uh -huh. Ryan That's true. Ryan That's true. Tannehill's an underrated handsome Hold guy. on. Hold on. Hold on. Yeah. Ryan Tannehill. Yeah. Wait, wait, wait. Former Miami Dolphins quarterback. Who, who's he with now? He's with now? the Tennessee Titans he's now. He's with the Titans now. Is he starting? He's start, He's back starting he's now. Back he was starting. injured for a while. Malik Willis was in there. And yeah, okay. Yeah, like he's just he's got a very square-jawed feel about him. He's very okay. rough, very man's man type thing. Okay. Yeah. Give, me, give me some others. Um, I'm trying to think of who else made their way up into that top. Honestly, and you got to give Jalen Hurts some credit. So he was number two on my list. Okay, because he's handsome. Jalen Hurts. So I got to again. Like, First of all, the way in which he's describing this list has me in tears, and I'm just not laughing. He's like number two on my list. But go on. <laughs> number. <laughs> I hear like the old like ESPN number voice over number two. <laughs> But okay. I um that I bragged about the Heisman thing before. In yeah. all seriousness, one time, one year they were very kind and they let me come in and MC the dinner they have the night before. They bring in all the guys that are finalists okay. for a dinner and they have them and their families and they hand them out these plaques and they do all that. And I've watched. All these guys are young players mm -hmm. and so a lot of them would show up to that in their letter jacket or like a school issued polo or something like that because again they're 19 to 23 year old kids and they don't have money. Jalen Hurts rolled into that thing. <laughs> with like a turtleneck sweater Clean. with the jacket over the top. Clean. He looked presidential. And that's been the word I've used to describe Jalen Hurts everywhere he's gone since. He is presidential in his approach. He is always going to be the person you want it. out in front of your organization. I love it. I love it. I love it. I, love it. I agree with you. Okay, this list is great. Okay, I, I first of all, what were we talking about? Yeah. Uh, Sunday surprise. Sunday surprise. <laughs> so Brock Purdy, Sunday surprise. Yes. Mr. Irrelevant. Not as handsome as Jimmy. No. But. But. I think the, the cool thing about Brock is he was not overwhelmed by the moment. Yeah. And going in there, you've got this great – think about it. That San Francisco defense is the cell of the team. He goes up against them in practice every day. you got guys like Richard Sherman showing him love. Veteran guys because they understand – being a young player and getting thrust into that moment like that against a good Dolphins team. Like, two in that Dolphins offense on the other side have been sensational. And he went out there and he operated it. They didn't have to change what they did for that young player. And mm -hmm. I think that will always get you respect from veterans. When mm -hmm. you go out, he didn't try and do too much. He said, we have really good guys. Yeah. Debo Samuel, really good. George yeah. Kittle, really good. Really I'll just throw good. them the ball and yeah. get it away from me, and it worked perfectly. But the reality is what I liked it was his celebration. 
Like he, Ooh, yeah. he felt it. And I, and then they, and everyone else, you have to get excited for a guy like that because that, that could be the first and last moment of his career in terms of throwing a, a touch, a touchdown, right? In a, in a football game. You never really, know. You don't know. I hope he gets to, you know, you never know. He's the starting quarterback yeah. going forward, but you don't know what happens. And in that moment, he sees the day. We all have hopes and dreams going into the game, <laughs> right? Like we, we do. We all have things that we want yeah. to accomplish and you never know if you're going to get the opportunity. All you know is how I prepare, how you stay ready and to actually go getting to do that. Like, my first meaningful playing time, I was on the road at Wake Forest. Talk was, to me about it. I was a senior. I hadn't played much up until that point. Okay. My best friend is our starting center at the same position. And he got hurt. Same thing. First quarter of that game, I went in the whole rest of the game. I was a senior at that point. So my dad was traveling around to all these games just in case I played. And, like, Aww. seeing him on the field after that game, I broke down in tears. I was like, that, that made was, me cry. It, like, was I the, got it was the thing I had been waiting for my whole life. Aww. It was what I had wanted to be. And so for Brock Purdy, I'm sure being an NFL quarterback has been on the dream board for a long time. And uh. to get to realize it in that moment and to be ready for it's a pretty incredible thing. Oh, boy. So, wait, what happened in that moment? Did your dad walk up to you and say, I'm proud of you, Junior? What did he do? Yeah, I just I, I looked at him. I said, damn, that felt good. And then we hugged big and I cried a whole bunch. Uh. And it was great. <laughs> It was, it's, it was, it Did was, he cry? Oh, yeah. Oh, my God. Oh, that's, well, I mean, you saw, and like, by the way, anyone, if any of you were giving Caleb Williams grief about crying after that game yeah. or Max Duggan, yeah. shame on you guys. Yeah. Sorry they care about something. <laughs> A lot. <laughs> that being said, you never want to be the guy that gets caught slipping because they will put you on TV Oh, yeah, lunch. for sure. Oh, for crying. And so that's what you, th you throw but the towel. But if you watch sports, everyone's crying. Like everyone. You, everyone. I've not, I've not, not seen a grown man cry that's, ever. That's in a true. loss, in a win, in all of it. I've never. Emotional. Yeah, wait, you know, Kobe, uh, may he rest in peace, used to always say to, he, he said his daughters would say, Gigi more particularly, would say, Dad, I've never seen you be emo. Like, you never cry. And he said, I'm going to show you when I cried. And it was when they lost in the finals against Boston. He was like, I cry and I still cry. Like, in that special moment, just to show that emotion, I really appreciate you saying that about you and your dad. I, bring, where's Golik? Can we put him on the show? Oh, listen, I'm sure he's ready and available right now. The problem is, is I did the show next to him for two and a half years, mm -hmm. and he's got this full head of hair, and then he decided to grow, like, the gray beard. Uh -huh. And all of my friends started very publicly thirsting over my dad. Oh. And so now I can't sit next to him like because that. Because he's so handsome now. Yeah. People started calling him a zaddy. Yeah, well, people love a zaddy. I love a zaddy. I know. I love a zaddy. And people started doing all that, and when they're talking about that, and it's oh. your dad, and he's right next to you, it's, You're like, like, it's all right, gross. Man, like, you don't want to hear about it. Okay, I'm trying to have fun over here on Good Man Island, <laughs> and you're just polluting it with your zaddiness. <laughs> That's a deep cut, folks. He's still in Good Man Island. All right, so uh, the other Sunday surprise, Bengals. Uh, Bengals, let's get that right. Is it Bengals or Bengals? How do you say it? Because I, I go back and forth. I say them both. I say aunt and aunt, too. Like, yeah. I'm not beholden tomato, to anymore. Tomato, tomato. Exactly. You get it. All right, all right. Uh, okay, so they defeat the Chiefs 27-24. Uh, I've spent so much time on everything else. Quickly walk through, walk me through Joe Burrow beating Patrick Mahomes. And, and why is that? Why does he own him, if you will? Well, I think it's about Joe Burrow really following the path that Patrick laid out in front of him, right? Which is? Which is learning how to adjust when you are one of the best and everyone else starts playing you differently because of that. Yeah. We saw that happen with the Chiefs a couple of years ago. People started trying to take away big plays from them, and so Patrick had to dial it back a little bit. You're used to it. Like, think about Joe Burrow and Patrick Mahomes. They've been making big plays their whole life. Right. Chucking the ball everywhere. They've got these great weapons. They want to be on the plays that are on the sports that are highlight reel. Yeah. It's a lot easier to do that for guys with great ability. It's a lot harder to have to dial it down and to make the easy play and yeah. to take what's right in front of you and to mm -hmm. do all that stuff. And so for Joe Burrow to get better at that, I said he right now is like Neo in the Matrix when he started seeing the zeros yes. and ones. Everything's slow for that dude right now. Yeah. Everything's coming down quick. And I called it going into this weekend because how this game stacked up, it was the last of the late games. Yeah. Kicked off like a half hour, pseudo primetime feel. You're going up against the number one ranked Kansas City Chiefs. And remember, we left this Bengals team for dead. They lost a couple of games early in the season. Yep. And so they got to go in the dark and they got to go to work yeah. and everything started to gel a little more. And your quarterback is still that dude, mm -hmm. like Joe Shiesty, whatever you want to call him. Like, yeah. He's that dude, yeah. and so now they got back onto the primetime stage, and it's because they've got better weapons. Like That's Jamar it. Chase and T. Higgins, number one receivers. Sure, sure. The Chiefs have Patrick Mahomes and a lot of very good, very different skilled receivers. They don't have one receiver that's as good as those two. Personalities. 
Talk to me about the personalities of a Joe Burrow versus the personality of a Patrick Mahomes. Because for me, as a fan, I take that into consideration when I watch them play and what they decide they'll do, how they move, how they move out when they're literally off the field versus how they move on the field, to me, is very indicative of how they play. Yeah, I, I think so. And for Joe, it's always been interesting because even going back to LSU, he's been that guy that's been so effortlessly cool. Whatever your definition of it is, mm -hmm. him with the cigar after the game mm -hmm. at LSU, mm -hmm. chopping it up with those guys, him with the fronts and the grills in and stuff like that. He's done that. Patrick Mahomes has operated like someone who sees himself as the face of the NFL mm -hmm. and wants to try and be, you know, very accessible to brands. He's got all these sponsorships, but it still does feel for both of them, I will say, very natural. It seems like they're being themselves. I agree. And I think that's why people gravitate towards them on the field yeah. is because I know who you are yeah. in every moment. I know you're not going to change, and I know when I need a big play, too. I their personality, you. they want the smoke. They want that moment on their shoulders every time. You are, for me, if I had to illustrate and describe you, you are my Patrick Mahomes slash Joe Burrow. When I want a big play, when I want you to, you want the smoke. When you come here, you want the smoke. And the burrito. And the burrito. And the burrito. You guys, give it up for Mike Oli Jr. <laughs> Bongos. Normally our band is here with our bongos. Uh, I appreciate you so much. Um, and can we do this again? Absolutely. We got to talk off camera about things we need to do for you. There we go. We'll, uh, we'll figure this out. We'll figure We'd love to come back. <laughs> I, I appreciate you guys having me. It's fun to come out I here and hang with everybody. I appreciate you. We'll be right back in just a few moments. Bye.